And hi, Mark. Hi, sorry to be late. I did not realize how much slipping and sliding I was going to do on the way here. Oh, my God. Well, that's one reason I'm at home. Yeah. It's really horrible. Uh, it's ridiculous. ridiculous. It's ridiculous. Um, okay, so uh, the agenda revisions or additions, and um, I noted that we have this letter from this guy, Bernie Paquette, that I sent you, so we can talk about this later. Um, we can't make any... Um, about the invasives? Excuse me? Like, about making the invasive yeah. commission or about whatever? Invasive. We can talk about it later. We can't make any decisions. We can't you know, like vote on anything, but we can certainly discuss it. Um, and then the minutes. It was the minutes from November. Do you guys, I forgot to send them out again. Do you guys have them? Mm -hmm. them? Mark, you did them and then I revised them some. Yeah, I was looking over them last night, the night before. I mean, from what I saw, they looked fine. And I saw, I sent them all, I sent them to all of you. I know that. And they look fine to me, Stephanie. I mean, I could quibble with a couple of things, but it's, it's not worth it. So, yeah. Yeah, you were the one that wrote them. They were fine. No, Mark wrote them. Mark wrote them. Wow. Larry, Larry never takes minutes. Oh, we need somebody to take minutes right now. <laughs> <laughs> Larry never takes minutes. That's Larry, you gotta have a turn. That's one of his privileges. He's vice chair and he does a lot of work. All right. So who's gonna take minutes? Tracy. I would say no, because I have a very grouchy child upstairs right now. So I'm probably gonna have to bail. <laughs> oh, okay. Don't know if you guys can hear it. <laughs> hey, where's, what happened to Scott? I thought Scott was gonna come and take minutes. Well, Charlotte could tell us, but we can't hear her. So. We, can't hear, we can't hear you, Charlotte. We'd love to hear you, but we can't. Um, Julie, how about it? Sure. Let me let me uh, get something to write notes. I got to write notes. Hey, yeah. Charlotte, if you can hear us, you can try and type in the meeting chat, too. That might let you speak if you can't figure out how to unmute, too. Good idea. Um, also, sorry for typing here the wrong way, everybody. I swear I had no grammar. I'm looking at it now. <laughs> so the host could unmute her usually. Well, I, I just don't know how to. Her. Okay, when Julie comes back, is there a motion for minutes to approve the minutes? So chat and pin. Um, exactly. It could be none of us are the host. <laughs> you know, there's no host here. It's really interesting. You're not the host, Larry? I should be, but I couldn't get on when I tried to go that route. And I, let's see, what am I, where am I? Can you mute us or unmute us? Uh, no, I'm, like I'm checked in, not as Cal as strong. Yeah. I couldn't get in through Cal as strong, you recall, because it required right. a vacation I couldn't get access to. I'm just in as myself. So apparently it's just us chickens and there is no host. I think that's correct. Yeah. Okay. Well, we're well, okay. Yeah. We're all equal tonight. There you go. Aren't we all equal every night? <laughs> Not when there's a host. <laughs> the host has power. The host can shut us out. The host can send you away, send somebody away if they're bad. <laughs> okay. 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 Well, I'll, just, I'll just leave if you guys get bad. Okay. <laughs> so we had a motion to approve the minutes and we had a second. All in favor. All right. All, right. All right. Okay. Just approved. Okay. Um, now the next item on the agenda is town report. Uh, remember, we're supposed to do a town report every year for the town report. I mean, a Calis Conservation Commission report for the town report. And Larry's been doing them the last few years, and I did them all the years before that. So I sent that out, and I got zero enthusiastic responses to do the report this year. And Larry said, "By golly, it's not fair." So I said, I'll do it. I'll put it together, but uh, it's due the 15th. So I'm going to try to do it. And it's going to be short and sweet. And I'll send it all around. And you can make little corrections and send it back. And then I'll send it to Barbara. And Barbara, we always get uh, extensions anyway. But if we can do it by the 15th, that would be good. So I'll do that. Unless somebody else wants to do it. Okay, we just go, you just go back through the minutes and see what we did. And anyway, 
And look at last year's to see the format. Okay, now the budget is interesting. Um, uh, I didn't quite understand this budget, so I asked Denise about it. And she didn't quite understand it either. Um, we, um, we used to get, we used to ask for, I think, 8,000 um, for the conservation fund. And then last year or the year before, the select board said that things were very, very tight and they were trying to cut whatever they could. And so they cut it down to, this is 5,000. I thought they cut it to 4,000. In any event, uh, I was talking to Larry about it earlier and I said, well, why don't we ask for 10,000? Because there's only 25,000, there's less, a little less than $25,000 left in the fund. That is not a lot of money if we need to leverage something. I think we need to start building it back up. So what do you think? I think that's a great idea to try. We can only ask. We can only, I mean, what do other town organizations get? You don't even want to know it's so little. <laughs> You know, I once looked and thought, well, I could use this to bolster our, our request for uh, for more. And it was so small that I like went, let's just keep asking for what we think we need. Mm -hmm. And well, the, we got we to build it back up. The town. Yeah. What'd you say, Larry? The fund is not for us, it's for the town, you know? I mean, it's not like we're asking money for our committee to do stuff exactly. Exactly. So does that, somebody want to make a motion on that? And we can, you know, about asking, um, getting back to the select board, she said by, by Saturday with um, a request for $10,000 for the fund. How does it work? Does the select board at the end of the day decide what goes in the budget that goes before the voters? I, think so. I have a question for you, and this is probably just my lack of knowledge about how things are typically done in Calus. But does the CONCOM get any kind of funds set aside in case we want to purchase lands or anything like that or to put into conservation long term? I don't know how that works in Calus. It's the conservation to, like, fund. Raise the funds. <laughs> well, that's what we're talking about actually now, Tracy, is the, the conservation fund, it's called. And that's the, the money that's being set right. aside to purchase land. Right. Movements or contributors. Right, right, right. So the reason, so the reason I asked is, I obviously I looked at the budget and it's minuscule. Um, and having worked on a town conservation commission, obviously it was in New Hampshire and not Vermont. Our operating budget was significantly higher, and it wasn't like I was living in a huge town. But we had, you know, obviously funds that we had built up over time that were specifically for if we wanted to, you know, purchase additional land to put onto a conservation area or things like that. But, um, you know, it wasn't necessarily a yearly operating budget, but we sometimes like rolled over money in case something popped up. That's why I asked this all. Well, where'd the money come from? The, where'd the money budget. Come from? Just, it was just board. by the town. Yeah. But it was, I was shocked. And I looked at the budget. I was like, wow, that's not much. <laughs> well, so like, but well, we have right now twenty five thousand dollars in the fund. Oh, we have twenty five. They said five thousand. Oh, about twenty five. Yeah. It's like a little okay. bit more than twenty four thousand in then the that, fund. Then that's not that different. I just saw the operating budget, which is the much smaller budget. So I yeah, didn't see the twenty five thousand. Then you're fine. I honest, that's not that much different from what we were operating at at my other town. But since you're new, I want to explain that we had. 60,000 or 70,000 or something in it. And then the folks who are um, renovating Memorial Hall asked for $50,000. And what all we do, we, we make recommendations to the select board. They control the money. And then, yeah. and we made that recommendation and so they agreed to it. So it went, <laughs> went down $50,000 pretty suddenly. Right. Well, it wasn't well, suddenly. Yeah. Years yeah, ago. but I that that's why it went down, right? Like we chose to do something with said money. Okay. Yeah, that's um that was more I was just seeing the like five grand or whatever it was. And I was like, that's not enough. What if we want to buy something? So, yeah. Yeah. Um, and then what we um the last project we did was the Armstrong farm down on the Pekin 
um, Brook Road on the at the at the intersection yep. there. Um, and I don't remember how much we gave toward that. That was something, you know, that we we worked with the land trust on that. And uh, I just don't remember. Does anybody remember how much we? Um, that was before my time as well. That's Tracy. I'm kind of in your space. I've been on the yeah. Computer, I, I was to... also gonna. The other item that I'm sorry to be like annoying and have to ask so many questions, but oh. the other item that I wanted to talk about when was like the last natural resource inventory done for town of Callis, or is that like not something? These are I'm just thinking about like big budget items that you could potentially use to justify asking for more money. We just if, did that. What was it? Four, five years ago? Four or five years ago? It's yeah. on the. Have you seen it? It's on the town's website. I probably looked at it and I probably read it and then probably forgot it because I just have too many other things going on. Um, and does so for Vermont, is it typically like a 10 year to 10 to 15 year cycle that those get updated? We've that Everybody's was the first thing we had done. Oh, there is no mandatory cycle for things like that, Tracy. This was a this was a standalone um, project that okay. Yeah, no, that's just that's interesting to know. Yeah, I know, and it's not necessarily consistent town by town, but um, I think in New Hampshire towns, we're starting to update them every 10 years, every 15 years by the time it usually got done um, to sort of correspond with updates to the legislature updates. So, but okay, interesting. If it was done five years ago, it should still be pretty accurate. And yeah, that's a really interesting uh, um, uh, thought because, you know, it never occurred to me that we might want to have it updated someday. So yeah, that's a great thought. Yeah. But, I mean, yeah. you think about it, right? Like lands get sold off, people change the way they're using their lands, things get filled in, you know, based on permits or God forbid the dam fails and Curtis Pond's a totally different landscape in five years and supports different species, right? You need to have the flexibility to update those plans and understand how the natural resources are being used in the town. So, mm -hmm. you know, they, which, they are not stagnant. I'm actually glad you're asking these questions because it's kind of making me think of some things. And one of them is that I just wanted to tell you all that it's just interesting that um, somebody on the Hardwick Conservation Commission, who I know, contacted me and said, we're looking at a couple of people to do a natural resources inventory for us. And Matt Peters is one of them. And I know he did one for you. What do you think of him? And I said, I thought he was terrific. And I think that, you know, he just, he did a really good job. He worked really well with us. He did a beautiful public presentation. And uh, anyway, so they ended up hiring him. So I just, she wrote back and said, yeah, we decided, you know, yes, he sounds great. Uh, anyway, that was just nice. Um, Thinking out loud here, you could also put in for some additional budget for invasive species management, right? We talked about knotweed, phragmites, um, colt's foot is really aggressive in town, I've noticed, um, purple loosestrife um, over at Curtis Pond, right? Stuff like that you could use as a, a reason for increasing budget. You know, the, in, the invasive species issue is, um, it's kind of a little bit of a, I don't know, thorny one here, because we have some major, we have um, Cherville, Cherville, that wild Cherville, yeah, a lot of it, and Peter, There's a Harvey, lot of everything in, everywhere now, Peter Harvey, who lives on Old West Church Road, has taken it upon himself for the last few years to organize his neighbors um, to pull Cherville, and he also has gotten the town road crew not to mow along along there at certain times and yeah. we we also have something in the roadside management thing was it the roadside vegetation plan that joanne garten did for us a few years where she talked about some of the um strategies of, of, of basically mowing not mowing or mowing at certain times it's just so hard to implement these things you know you work with try to work with the road crew now there's a completely new road crew it's you know, also not just the road crew too right like when electric companies come in and work at utility poles, they move, that is one of the fastest way that invasive species get moved throughout the Northeast is getting moved by electric companies when they go to do mowing and do work on poles. And that's even, no, even just no slam against grades. them. It's incredibly challenging to control invasive species. Yeah, they are. Just grading the roads, they would move the stuff around. Mm -hmm. 
you know. So can I just throw in one thing about it? You know, Callis has a couple of not very many, but a couple of patches of Phragmites. And oh yeah. And I it just that. seems so worthwhile when it's not wholesale in the streams and 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 mm. and um water areas that to try to deal with it. So I just would put a big plug for thinking about how to manage that. I mean, I think some of it, I mean, I you know, deal that with it while it's small. We, I mean, we talked about that last year and I think Neil went out, didn't you Neil go out and pull some? Yeah, Neil went out and he went on down, but we, there's a, we need, we need to sort of survey where it is. And then a lot of it's on, I think some of it's on private land. And I've done enough research to know that probably if it's a big enough patch, you really have to fight, you have to come up with a plan, meaning it's going to get cut in July or, you know, you have to have an approach and then work it with somebody. Some of these were um, probably not going to get rid of, but we might right. be able to manage right. them so that they don't expand significantly. I agree. And I think, you know, I'm not saying that we should target every invasive species, right? That's just not practicable, but things like Phragmites that really are significantly damaging, really both visually and to ecosystems, I mean, where they don't have tons of patches, I think putting in some budget to do town survey, figure out where they're growing, where we can come up with a plan, like things like Prag, I think that's a great idea. And I think it's a worthwhile use of budget. So you're talking about hiring somebody to do this because we don't we don't have the time or the expertise to do it ourselves. So I when mean, you- I have the expertise, I definitely don't have the time. Yeah, no, I mean, there's like um, uh, Red Start Consulting out of Corinth, I think, does a really like pretty yeah, significant. They were, they were a, what's his name? Um, Marcus was Julie's um, forester from Red Start. Yeah. Oh, Red I, Start. Yeah. I yeah, actually I interviewed there a thousand years ago <laughs> and got the job, but I couldn't move because I just bought a house. Um, so yeah, but they're they're great. And they're really well known for doing invasive species management in Vermont. So I didn't yeah. know that. Yeah. They do a lot of work for DOT managing invasives. So basically to be come up with a plan and maybe and maybe implement the plan because we, you know, I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I really don't know what the cost would be. Um, you know, for like if you just do four or five patches of frag quote that would cost. But I I, you know. I think it would be worthwhile like, to at least examine what it could potentially cost. Seems like this is. <laughs> I mean, you really need a survey to know where it is, so that we can decide where to target it. Right. Yeah. This I mean, your conversation to me then kind of like, oh, should we throw something in the budget right now? I don't. I'm not sure if like, if our budget, if the conservation fund really works that way. We kind of like ask for some money that, and it's, we ask for what we think the town will support. Yeah. No, I'm just saying that you could use that as a potential, like, here's why we're asking for more budget. I'm not saying we can just throw it in I'm saying you could use it as justification to potentially ask for more funds. Well, in the past, I know the first question is going to be, can you take that out of the conservation fund? Does it qualify? And which makes me turn red with embarrassment because I was supposed to be working on updating our conservation fund guidelines like three years ago. Remember, we all worked on it. And then I said, well, I'll take a stab at coming up with some language and didn't. But right now, our cons as I recall, the conservation fund guidelines include education. And I think we've used we used it in the past. We used some of that money for education. The problem is, is that the, the, the primary use of that money should be, was intended to be, and should be for land conservation, for purchasing or, you know, helping out with a purchase of some land to conserve. So I'm just throwing out different thoughts about this, about sort of what, what we could do. Um, we could certainly ask the select board in the context that Tracy, you're explaining it, but, I, we, I don't begin to know how much money we would need. How much money would we, even if we decided, yes, we're going to do try to get something going, get hire somebody to start doing um, some kind of a invasive management plan or surveys or whatever. 
what kind of money were we asking for? Well, you know, I, I don't know. Maybe I should want me to contact Marcus and see if he has any ideas on how. Now, I haven't been in touch with him for a long time, and I don't, you know, I just because I just know him. You want me to do that? See if he has any ideas. Well, I don't know. I don't know that there's time in that. Oh. Well, they haven't. They're not finalizing the budget on on I'm Saturday. About future. You know, I don't know. No, I think it's a good idea. I think it'd be a great idea to talk to them and find out what they do and what they could do. What do do they do? And then what what would the various? I'm sure that there's different levels of work that yeah, they yeah. do. How, how do they do a survey, for example? Yeah. <coughs> I had to come back in and get unmuted. Um, so typically what they do, I mean, they look at, you know, aerial mapping. Um, <laughs> you can actually identify frag pretty easily in aerial mapping, though I don't know what level the aerial mapping is for Callus, but so that's one way to start. They'd probably target roadside areas, roadside wet areas. That'd probably be the first area. Um, do like drive-by surveys the town um and then kind of identify them on maps make a gis map and go from there that'd be how i would do it at least you're just talking about fragmites right yeah just for frag that's all the other ones there's are a lot totally of other different. ones there's a lot of other oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah yeah but like so for frag for example that's how i would approach it i'd also probably put something out to like ask townspeople to report it if they knew it <coughs> That way you would catch some of that private land um, that way. But that's one example about how you could start. So the this, I mean, <laughs> this is something the Conservation Commission wants to take on. Mm -hmm. Do you want to? I don't know. It's a huge amount of work. It seems like. yeah. well, it depends. You know, I mean, it depends. If we're looking for money to hire somebody to do, we're not going to, I wouldn't suggest that we could do the survey. You know, I would suggest that we see if we can get the money. To, right. You might even be able to get a grant. You know, Larry, you've dealt with, haven't you dealt with some of the organizations that do grants to people like conservation commissions? There must be something. I mean, the whole invasive species. I, I It seems worthwhile to me to explore further, but I wonder yeah. if I put it on, a, on an agenda for another meeting so that we can credit to it instead of trying yeah. to noodle on it a little further this was yeah. just me throwing stuff out right <laughs> it wasn't committing us to doing this but and even if we don't you know we don't ask for the budget this year i mean now we have that as something in our heads that maybe potentially we want to think about asking for some more budget in the future year okay so do you agree we'll put that on agenda for a future meeting yeah. does that make sense to everybody yep. no <laughs> Noreen, you know, if you want, we'll just keep keep trying to remember to send you agendas. Sometimes, I mean, this is sort of a this is kind of a passion of mine because there's relatively little Phragmites, I think, in Callus, which means, man, it's time to go for it. Yeah, but there's a big yeah, there is a big patch on North Callus Road, um, to midway between where the North Callis road, where the, sorry, I'm almost, um, where, oh, I'm sorry, I can't think of where it is. Well, if, if you're, you're coming from the town office, office from the town office. And the town you know. office is halfway between where the, a little bit beyond the town office going towards. Oh yeah. North Callis. Yeah. Right. There's also a small patch at the bottom of Elmsley that I noticed. Okay, so I think we should put it, we can put it on our agenda for January. Okay. Why don't we do that? Save it for after the holiday. <laughs> okay, Phragmites, here we come. <laughs> Just Phragmites or, or other invasives? <clears throat> is it Phragmites we're trying to jump on? Well, I think Noreen's point is a good one, and that is that if there's not that many, I mean, something like it's knotweed. Not that, controlling that one. You know, we're not going to take on Japanese knotweed, but because there's so much of it and it's so impossible. But if if phragmites is something that we might be able to get it ahead of, that's how certainly. You, so, Tracy, how do you 
get rid of it? Do you, you cut, just cut it or do you have to pull it? They pull it, to- spray it. Um, they've also started looking at sugar watering um, as a way of controlling it. It can really dampen how its ability to survive for some reason. I don't really know the science behind it. Um, it's still pretty young and they're still testing it, but uh, Fish and Wildlife Service has found some success with that. And also the Vermont Invasives page, has, uh, website has a lot of information on it. Yes. So we'll put it on the agenda for next time. Um, so we're not going to ask for anything more in the budget except for $10,000 for the conservation fund. Is that what we decided? Yeah. Okay. I second. Okay. All yep. in favor? Aye. All opposed? Anybody opposed to it? Okay. Um, and I asked Denise, why is green up included in our budget? Because we don't do green up. But she said, well, they didn't know where to put it. So they put it in the conservation. Okay. So that's why that's there. Um, okay. Uh, next is the shade tree public comments. Did you get any, Neil? No, a, a few people reached out and kind of asked me questions about it, but I didn't get any feedback um, from anyone except Dan Singleton and had a nice conversation with him. He, he was the county forester for anyone who doesn't know and lives here in Calais. Um, and, and one of the things that came up, which we've been back and forth a little bit with people at the state with, uh, is about this silvicultural exemption. Um, so there's a state law that says that towns can't, um, can't inhibit people from practicing silviculture and doing like forestry operations. But it sounds like it's really talking about town plans and uh, zoning ordinances. So it doesn't really directly apply to this. Uh, okay. Go ahead. Okay. Um, but I think Dan and I both like the idea of like that we're not trying to inhibit people from you know practicing silviculture on their own properties, which sometimes means removing trees along roadsides or putting in log landings or whatever you're doing as part of a current use plan or things like that. But they um, would still be subject to the to the rules about, I mean, they'd have to contact you if it were certain. I right? think so. I don't think we can say those trees aren't shade trees because we don't know which trees they are ahead of time. Um, I, that's kind of my understanding of it. So. So I added a little bit of language in here, which feels like it doesn't do that much, but it just says that the select board can't like, you know, if somebody complains about a tree that's gonna get removed and it goes to the select board, the select board can't like stop people from practicing silviculture without a good reason. You put that in this, in this version? Yeah, it's under section seven. And I was particularly thinking of you Stephanie, because I wrote, um, let me see if I can find it here. I wrote, the select board may not unreasonably prevent shade trees from being removed as part of accepted silvicultural practices. On private land? Uh, yes. Star. Oh, right. In rights of way, yep. Yeah. Right, which are trees that belong to the landowner, but they're in the right of way, so they're governed by this. Um, but that that word unreasonably, I was writing it. And I was thinking, oh, Stephanie's cringing right now as I write that because it's one of those like, what does that mean? Um, but I don't I don't know how else to kind of say that without I don't know having some whole big set of arbitrary rules about. Yeah, that. I mean, you'd have to go into you know what what would be the circumstances under which somebody could do that, and you know, I mean, that's not something you want to put into this. I don't think. Right. Does that feel to, to you folks like a reasonable way to, have I given enough background? Does everyone, does everyone know what we're talking about? <laughs> Am I making sense here? Yeah, I think so. Okay, is, do you feel like this is a good way to address that particular thing? Kind of saying, look, it's 
these trees, if they're bigger than a certain size and on roadsides, they are shade trees. You do have to follow this process, but if it's a silvicultural thing, you can't be like prohibited from doing it without a really good reason. Is this something you ran by Dan Singleton? I mean, does he, you think he might buy this? Yeah, he would like it to be somehow, he would like it to be written in that there's an exemption for silvicultural activities that you don't have to contact the tree warden at all. Um, but I don't think we can do that because you can't identify those trees ahead of time. You don't know which yeah. trees they are, you know. Well, I'm not familiar with the, the statute. I haven't looked at it a while ago, but it seems to me that a town doing things in its own road rights of way ought to be able to at least have a discussion about it. Yeah. If, if a, a landowner wants to cut right up into the town's road right of way. Yeah. That's what, um, so I talked to Joanne at Urban Community mm -hmm. Forestry and she ended up getting in touch with um, League of Cities and Towns and that's what their lawyer said is like, know that there is this law about civil cultural exemption but it doesn't apply here. Like you, Oh, good. So, so you, also, you also added that paragraph in the beginning which I thought was terrific about making yeah, it something clear. That Hallie asked me to add just because it wasn't clear a lot of people kind of how how it works with trees yeah um so i added that just explaining that those trees belong to the landowners but they don't have the right to cut them down and then i added a, a link to this resilient right-of-ways vegetation assessment which i had um which i had mentioned but hadn't linked to and then there was one rewording in that section seven tree removal, which was uh, someone on the select board asked me to change the wording because they found it confusing. As I said, I said something about approval from the tree warden and they said, well, it's not really a approval, it's following the notification process. Um, and well, then there's- That's the, what you said. Yeah. That's what I said, I, I did what they said. And then, and then this thing about the silvicultural exemptions. Those are the only things I've changed. Um, and then the other thing that I wanted to talk about was we had in here that shade trees on roadsides in right of ways are any tree greater than six inches in diameter, um, which is totally arbitrary. And it's because that was what was in the road standards before. So we kind of held on to it. Um, and that was one that Dan specifically asked us to consider, like, what if we made that a little bit bigger? And, I, and his thinking is that it would be easier for people to do kind of thinning, tending type stuff uh, along the roadside if they had a little bit more latitude, like they could cut trees that were eight or 10 inches, um, but still include the larger trees as shade trees. So here's an eight inch tree. Here's a 10 inch tree. Um, so I don't know, I personally, I'm fine with that. Like I think it still does what we want. And if it makes it easier for landowners, I'm fine with pushing the diameter up to eight or 10 inches instead of six. But uh, you're saying the definition of a shade tree is gonna be eight to 10 inches, not just six inches. Well, it could be one we, or the other, right? It would be one or the other. Yeah, we could say we could leave it at six inches and greater. We could say eight inches and greater. Or we could say ten inches and greater. Um, I have a question about that, Neil. How does that? I remember we had fairly extensive discussions about this issue of of wanting to make sure that all the saplings aren't being taken down. I mean, because these are trees that are going to grow up and they could be important later. Yeah. So I thought that's one of the reasons that we kind of settled on the six inch. Yeah. Yeah, there's a separate section in here about managing small roadside trees. And it was kind of, a, we didn't feel like we could include those as shade trees because people have to be able to mow and, you know, right. brush. Um, but we kind of did it as a separate section, like recognizing that we want to promote some of those young trees to replace older ones and that we can have a voluntary program and work with people excuse me, to do that. So this um, wouldn't have any, that this isn't connected with that at all. It wouldn't make any. I don't, I mean, I don't know. It would be like, like if a landowner 
you know, can cut those small trees if they, if they choose to not save young trees. They could do it up to six inches. They could do it up to eight inches. Uh, I'm not really sure, I guess, how it would, how it would affect that. Re recruiting those young trees to make them bigger depends on the goodwill of people either way, I guess. Um, but there's some subset of trees that are between six and eight inches that would be saved if, or, or would be subject to these regulations now, and they wouldn't if we increased the diameter. Um, it doesn't feel like a huge difference to me, but I don't really know. Anybody? Do you think we do you think we should increase it? Is that what you're saying? Um, <laughs> uh, to be honest, I like I don't really care. I don't think it makes a huge difference either way. And I see Dan's point, and I, I like see how it might be nice for landowners to have a little bit more flexibility. So I guess if it were just up to me, I would push it up to eight inches. But uh, I can see if people are concerned that we're like, uh, well, if, if, if pushing it up to eight inches would mean Dan Singleton wouldn't go after the plan, <laughs> it might be that might be an additional reason to do it. I mean, I yeah, I'm not that we need to placate one person, that. and I think the I think the select board will probably would you know do what we recommend at the end of the day, but. Um, I don't know how to think about it. You know, I don't. I don't really know how to think about it. I think. That, I, I guess know. the reason I said that I would go along with it is because I think that Dan represents more people. You know, there's probably a a fair number of people who aren't like whatever responding to my front porch forum post, but who do appreciate the flexibility to manage the trees on their property and and if it helps them out a little bit or whatever. I can I can see that point of view, you know, on our, my own property. Like, oh yeah, I can see how that's nice to be able to kind of have a little bit more latitude to. I mean, frankly, I can't imagine anybody following any of these rules. <laughs> Great, right. you know. So I don't know that it makes any difference because I I I just I mean, how are people? You know, I mean, I just find I also find it kind of dismaying that you got so little response. Yeah. You know, what do people care about? They don't care about our trees. I don't know. Um, I do think that there's kind of this dynamic where we've been thinking about it in relation to the road crew and what the road crew does, and it will have a real effect there. Um, but they're kind of like, oh, it also impacts landowners. And we, and well, that's interesting. So it's something the road crew will have to pay attention to one way or another, either six inches or eight inches or whatever. Yeah, it matters to them. That's true. Yeah. yeah. You know, I think that landowners just don't see how it's going to affect them. You know, so what? I have a couple of trees on the roadside that's six inches or eight inches. I don't, right. I think most people just don't see, don't care about that. It's they're more the, the, the trees that are growing on more in the inner, in their property, you know, inner part of their property. They're not thinking about them until they need to for some reason. Yeah. And then right. It could be, I don't remember how much information was given at the various, you know, front porch forum and places about what this is, but it could be a lot of people said, I don't care about shade trees. Yeah. One way or the other, you know, I'm not going to read that. Right. Well, they are important in terms of, well, you know, here. things we've discussed before and in terms of holding water on this, you know, erosion, we're holding water, areas where we have, you know, no trees at all make a big difference. So those kinds of areas are important, but I don't think the regular landowners see that. So anyway, my two cents. So what do, what do you folks want to do? Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't feel like I'm qualified to tell you or to, I qualified to have an opinion about whether a six inch tree or an eight inch tree is necessary to retain water or if it makes the difference or yeah I lean towards taking your recommendation. Yeah I don't I don't know either. It feels, right? it feels totally arbitrary to me. So eight yeah. inches arbitrary is six inches. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
I don't think it should be 14 inches, <laughs> you know, then we're talking these big trees that people care about or whatever, but I don't know. So on, we have to do something. We have to, do, we have to make a decision. Does somebody want to move something? Let's keep it, let's say eight inches. No, I say six inches. I'm going to say six inches. <laughs> That's big enough tree to start making a difference and it'll right. grow up. I think we should do eight inches. I think it gives landowners more flexibility and the road crews. Okay. Okay, one for six inches, one for eight inches. Mark, <laughs> I'm taking a poll here. Mark, six or eight. Think about that six inch tree. Show us again. Neil, yeah. show us again. All right, so here's a six inch tree. Here's an eight inch tree. I'd say eight inches are bigger. <laughs> All right, eight inches or bigger. I'll, I'll agree with that. go with that. Okay. I okay. Know. So oh. do, we, do we need to take a formal vote? To... I don't know. We've been like formally approving this, but then it goes to the select board and they do what they want with it. I don't know if, <laughs> I don't know if it matters or not. I also, Neil, I have a, before we end a discussion about uh, this plan, I, I, have a, I have a question and I have a comment in addition to this, it has nothing to do with the size of the trees. So let's resolve the size of the trees and then I'll make my comment and question. So all in favor of eight, raise your hand. <laughs> all in favor of six, all those abstain. <laughs> okay, eight inches it is. Right. Sounds good. Okay. Every time I read this, I have more questions. I'm really sorry, Neil. That's, that's okay. Get them out now before it goes back to the select board. Yeah. So on, under hazardous trees, number eight. Yeah. The tree warden and deputy tree warden should advise landowners, the road crew, and other town officials on which shade trees are a hazard to public safety. Now, how and when and where would that be done? It's uh, it, it like only can be done if people ask us, you know, I, we can't like go do an inventory of all the thousands of trees and say right. this, or this or not. Um, so it's just like, you don't want to dedicate the next three years of your life looking at trees yeah. every day up and down the roads. Of but the what? implication, the, the, the implication or sort of is that, I mean, it's like, it's putting something on you that you're supposed to be advising landowners and road crews and town officials. It's like, wait a minute, they don't, they don't have time to do that. You know, I just wonder if there's a the way it can be phrased so that it's clear that this isn't something, some responsibility of yours, you know, to go around advising everybody. Last sentence there, if, if individuals wishing to remove shade trees are unsure whether those trees are hazardous, they must contact the tree warden or deputy tree warden for a hazard evaluation. I was kind of, I was trying to say like, it's uh, like we should advise people in that context when they ask for it. Well, you could just start out by saying, if asked. If asked. Would it uh -huh. make and then finish the sentence? I don't know. Maybe so. And then your sentence that follows it now, that's the first one, You're might right. be tweaked a little bit. Yeah, that's a great idea. If I just move that last sentence up to the beginning, yeah, and then. Yeah. And then, exactly, and then it continues with, then you should advise them. Tree warden and deputy tree warden will advise them. Yeah, will we'll provide advice or whatever it is. You're advising it, not overseeing it? No. Uh, yeah, no, I'm, I am determining whether it's a hazard tree or not if they ask me if they ask okay I'll change that first sentence to say something like I'll make a determination the, um, if if individuals wishing to remove shade trees are unsure if they're hazardous they must contact the tree warden or deputy tree warden who will conduct a hazard evaluation and then I put that at the beginning and delete the current first sentence and well but what also about the road crew um, well, it's it, it, not just individuals, but it's it's individuals. Well, Land road crew, other town officials too. Uh, okay, that's all those. Yeah. 
Tracy looks like she's about to burst out laughing. Oh, maybe she's just frozen. She is frozen. <laughs> Am I frozen? That sounds about right for my internet, so. <laughs> well, it's um, my photo, Tracy, so. Stacy. Yeah, it looks nice. <laughs> yeah, you have a nice smile. <laughs> Uh, okay. Drew Lamb read this? <laughs> I don't know. I haven't, I haven't talked to Drew in quite a while. <clears throat> he might be interested in how much work you're giving him. <laughs> you could take, you could just put, take out tree warden. You could just say the deputy tree warden or the assistant tree warden. You don't have to. Hey, he had a chance to comment on it. That's right. <laughs> was Drew the assistant tree warden? He was appointed. Drew was appointed. Yeah. So you want to hear my comment? Yeah. <laughs> I'm dying to. This is something that has been bugging me from the beginning. Why is it called a shade tree? Shade, <laughs> shade has a connotation. Now, I have a proposal. I have a footnote here. Okay. I would put under number three, maybe put it at the end of the first sentence. Shall be considered shade trees, asterisk, footnote, something like this. Shade trees, in quotes, is a term used by the legislature to denote, I don't even remember what it denotes, but it denotes something. However, the trees identified as shade trees do not actually have to provide shade. <laughs> I mean, seriously, it's like, why did they, when they revised the statute two years ago, why did they continue calling it a shade tree when it's not? Right? It's any tree. Am I right or am I wrong? Is it just a tree that provides shade? You're absolutely right. It's any tree. It's a dumb name. It's idiotic. We can't change it, but we could. Yeah. I'd, like I'd like to clarify because. Maybe that's why nobody commented because they said, well, how many shade trees? <laughs> yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah, so, that's a good idea. It doesn't, it doesn't hurt to clarify in here, but, but, it, but we have to keep the term. Yes, I understand that, which is why I thought maybe a footnote, and I can send you that sentence. Um, sure. That would be great. But I'm not sure what it was denoting. The legislature... It's a term used by the legislature to note to denote trees that towns might want to preserve. Trees that are critical to the town's cultural, historic, or aesthetic character. Okay. I think that's sure. that's what they say. However, the trees identified as shade trees do not actually have to provide shade. <laughs> Do you, do you put an exclamation point in there or is that a little over the top for a town plan? <laughs> <laughs> yes, thanks legislature. Okay. <laughs> cool. Okay. Um, everyone ha everyone's happy with the other changes I've made here. And... What, do you, what do you do with it now? Go back to the select board with it? Yeah. What a headache, that's a lot of work. And we have to do an ordinance, right? Oh, let's not talk about it. <laughs> someday. <laughs> yeah, someday. This has to get passed first, and then the ordinance has to actually go. I think ordinances have to actually go to town meeting, like get voted on. But this, this doesn't. The select board just has to adopt it. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So, Thanks, everyone. Neil, you've done a, a just a stupendous job. You really. Yeah, have. you're. It, 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 you know commitment to attention and just the specifics is so impressive thanks your yeah. willingness to keep going with it too it's like mm -hmm. i'm amazed i haven't moved to mexico yet <laughs> but he's you're probably thinking about it they don't have shade trees in mexico yeah, sure they do it's sophisticated and i'll repeat my observation that if you ever get tired of what you're doing you'd probably be a pretty good lawyer <laughs> thanks Dave. Okay, so we will move on now to Noreen. Sorry for for separating about shade trees. Um, 
But Noreen has been with Larry with her, uh, has been dogging, dogging the planning commission on the Shoreland zoning. And they had another meeting that Noreen and I think Larry too attended. So Noreen is gonna update us, right Noreen? I will unless Larry wants to. Larry, you wanna do it? I'd be happy for you to give it a try. Mine would be a very short update. Okay. Uh, we're um, um, a small group of us, Larry, myself, David Allen Bogan, and sometimes uh, John Rosenblum regularly now attend the uh, planning commission meetings. Uh, and uh, Shoreland zoning is on the meeting and it always is followed by on the agenda and it's always followed by two or three more items, but we always get stuck someplace in the middle of shoreland zoning. So the agenda from each one could just be carried forward for at least five meetings. I think uh, the comment I would make is I think we have moved into a uh, constructive relationship with the Planning Commission and um, they're uh, they're they're willing to let us make comments during the meeting and I think they actually consider them. So I feel good about that. Um, I think that's a positive. Uh, I think also on the, uh, let me, now I'm gonna move from those general comments to where we are. Um, one of the things that I think the planning commission members have finally grasped and appreciate is the fact that when you talk about shoreland, you're really talking about two areas, the buffer, where virtually nothing can be done. You can't cut trees, et cetera. And then we're talking about the upland area, which is still allows some level of development and has different uh, standards that apply. So most of the um, shoreland zoning standards will now be split between the buffer and the upland zone, which I think is a really constructive way to organize. And, and if you were picking this up as a user, to be able to understand what goes on. Um, so we now are gonna have, um, we, we went through, I'm not gonna repeat what we did last week. I think we're, we've are we now got it included in the language that the area definition of the shoreland goes across public and private roads. That has been accepted by the planning commission. Um, and we've now separated thing, we then got stuck at this last meeting on a, on uses split between the buffer zone and the upland zone. And the sticking point is really the fact that because it's a shoreland overlay district as opposed to a, just a shoreland district, you get to this issue of, well, do you specify the use in the overlay area or do you rely on the uses as specified in the underlying district? Uh, I think we left the meeting, and Larry, correct me if I'm wrong, we finally left the meeting where uh, Gary Root is assigned a job to look at what all the underlying uses are, because we can, some places will have village districts, some, most of it will be rural residential, and some place will be the what, resource, whatever it is, district. And this and, didn't, and this didn't, Noreen, and this didn't convince him that they should get rid of the overlay and go no, back. Larry, Larry, tried, Larry tried one more time. And, and, you know, it, it was like, yeah, it was the conversation must have gone on for over half an hour on this. Okay. So it was really, really? confusing. And it, it, the question was should we specify in the overlay district what uses are allowable or conditional use? I mean, either permitted or conditional. Or should we rely on the underlying district to specify these and then say which one uses? in the underlying district are not allowed in the overlay. If they want to do that, that's, I think that's. It's It makes it, it's, I mean, it's clear from the discussion. It was very difficult. It'll come back again next time and where we'll end up is hard to forecast, I think. Um, we did go on to, from there. I mean, it is very positive though, that they are separating uh, the, buffer zone permitted and conditional uses from the upland permitted and conditional uses. We went on from there to dimensional standards. 
and nothing has changed. It's still a hundred foot setback. It's three hundred foot minimum shoreline frontage. It's minimum. I'm sorry, maximum impervious surface of ten percent. And after some discussion, they have now voted on and accepted that total maximum cleared area and impervious surface will be measured in the upland zone at 40%. It'll no longer be measured as part of the total shroud. It'll only be based on the upland zone. That was an incredibly tendentious, if that's the right word, uh, process. Um, I have to say I'm delighted that they got out, came out where they did, but it was work to get everybody on board. It was real work, and it finally dawned on them that, you know, they began to, which somehow, I, Gary Root did a very nice job writing up. Can't, can't, can't hear you, Noreen. I'm sorry. When you think about, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. So when you think about a lake as, a, as opposed to an individual parcel, then you start thinking about the buffer as being like a ring that goes around the lake and that, that it really becomes then an effective um, protection for the lake. As you, and then you think of the upland as an outer ring that goes around the buffer zone. So I think that helps help them to get a vision of why that was important. And I think it was also helpful to have them understand that if you specified this dimension based on the total area of the shroud, it basically would mean that you were gonna you allow most of the upland to be cut, if not all. And, and that's really detrimental to lakes and ponds. Okay, so that we got, we got through that, I think, although these things have a way of hiccuping and coming around again for the next meeting. But I think we got, we, they took a vote, so hopefully that'll hold. We then broached briefly the subject of non-conforming structures. And um, uh, I think the language that they have are hanging on so far is no non-conforming structure shall be enlarged or expanded or moved towards the shoreline. Um, section 3.8 goes on to specify that you cannot enclose a porch or a deck. And there was a great deal of discussion about whether that was reasonable to prohibit people from enclosing a porch or a deck. And I think that at this point, they're leaning to say, you can enclose a porch and heat it. It would be a conditional use approval. And the decision would be heavily made based on adequacy of septic system if this enclosed space were used for bedrooms or you know additional people in the house. Well, no, Rain, that would be the only issue, wouldn't it? it that would be the only issue of the if a change in in use of a of a room of a, from a from a porch to a to a room what other issue would there be? you know that came up to the drb recently what other issue would there be other than septic as long as no outside work is being done now in that case on curtis pond on the worcester road there was outside work being done that was not disclosed to the it was John McCullough told them they could go ahead and do it, which was to change the footings, change the footings, and he just told them to do it, that, that they didn't need a permit to do that. And the DRB was quite taken aback by that, right. but, they, but they'd already done it. Well, got, well that, that, you know. But anyway, what would be the problem other than that? If you're not doing anything outside work. Right, I mean, I don't. It would seem that uh, here's me talking and you're closer to it than I am the DRB. But if somebody wants, if this is the language that ended up in the zoning, i.e. people would be allowed to include, enclose a porch and make it a heated space if the DR, as a conditional use. And it would, it would seem that that would have to go to the DRB for a decision and perhaps whatever material the DRB wants to be included with that conditional use permit to justify. In other words, if you're enclosing the porch, you know, gets into building code issues of what, what kind of flooring, what kind of structural support and all of those kinds of things. But if it's a conditional, at least as if it's a conditional use, it would mean that it would come to the DRB for review prior to issuing permits. But this is just, you just said enlarged, expanded, 
or move closer to the shoreline, but it doesn't say anything about a change in use, or it does. No, it doesn't. And so that's one last sentence that would stand, but then there'll be something that second that says that, that that will say about enclosing porches would be a conditional use, but that enclosing decks would not be permitted. And I, I have to say, I'm the one with a giant deck who argued for not allowing that to happen. What about it enclose about what about changing the I mean, this is what happened on Curtis Pond was they just were changing the use from a screened in porch and then they were insulating it. They didn't were, they weren't changing the footprint at all, but they right. were changing and it, they needed a conditional use permit. But are they going to No, that would that would my understanding is that would be still a, a condition allowable under a conditional use permitting. OK, I just don't see the language in what you've. It, it, the language is not is going. This was a discussion. Now the language has to be finalized, and hopefully we'll see that before the next meeting on December twentieth. I think the only point to take away is the question was first was the, no porches are allowed to be enclosed, and then as people said, well, yeah, maybe we should enclose porches, but why can't we enclose decks too? And I think there there was a big discussion, and and finally I think people settled that okay, it's. It should be a legitimate use allow, to allow people to enclose their porches, assuming a conditional use permit is granted, not decks. In other words, you can't just have this big deck and, and build a giant structure on top of it. Right. So there's some discussion about needing definitions for porches and decks, and That's I may be putting thinking. that in as well. Right. So, so that was a general idea. I guess the best I could say is general idea. They were sent away. They left working to going, they left with the need to create actual language. The other comment I would make, I, we didn't, we never talked about these in detail. Neil, I don't know if you've ever looked at all of the tree, the vegetative, the tree management that's part of this. Um, you know, this, the language in here is just basically a straight adoption from the state regs, the state Vermont Shoreland Act, Protection Act. And it's been, you know, I don't, um, I, I can't say that anybody in the, you know, I don't think that we felt qualified to take that on, but it, you know, it's one of those complicated measurement systems of so many trees are allowed in this 25 square, you know, you, can, you know, it's a, it's a complex system. Yeah. Um, it's yeah, just that's, that's hard to imagine how you enforce it. That's how my understanding, having read their thing, is that they it's just exactly what the state said in the Shoreland Protection Act. Right. And I agree. It's this they were trying to kind of have a complicated system that would let people do thoughtful management, but not get away with too much. And it's just a mess because because it's unenforceable. Right. Uh, and the planning commission is kind of saying, well, we're going to go with that because people have to follow it anyway. I'm, I'm, I'm frankly not sure they all understand that even yet, if I can be candid, because they still persist in talking about how there'll be no tree cutting in the buffer. And I tried unsuccessfully one time, I guess, to explain that, yes, in fact, there will be under the standard of thinning that the state has, because, because John McCullough at least understands this and nobody contradicts him, that that's that that's what Callus will follow too. And if the state says it's okay, it's okay with Callus. Well, why don't they just prohibit any cutting in the buffer if that's uh, what they want? Well, uh, I think they may not fully understand that. I mean, and, and probably um, just as somebody who's a homeowner there, I mean, it, it does make, it, when you've got trees that are really overgrown, you might really want to thin the trees. If you, you know, and then the question also comes up, is it legitimate to limb up trees? And, and you know, they allow you to limb up trees, but, um, you know, if you have a, um, I don't know, just a, a jungle sort of of baby hemlocks all growing, do you really, are people not supposed to thin those hemlocks? I mean, they, that's what, it gets to sort of a mess, okay? I think they should have to consult with the tree warden. <laughs> no, the deputy tree warden. Deputy tree warden, that's better. <laughs> All right, and I'm nickel diming them on one more. You'll be proud of me on this, uh, Stephanie. I'm really pushing them on language. It, it says it has this opening paragraph under 
standards under the shroud and it says new development shall comply with all these lists of regs. That's good. However, I believe it should say new development and acknowledge, I'm going to say, and other activities within this standard, or you can, John McCullough said new development uses and tree management, but this, this shroud standards do not apply exclusively just to new development. So we'll see how, we'll see how that rings itself out next time as well. Excellent. <laughs> That's about as far as we got, right, Noreen, last night? That's it. That's where we got. So what happens next? Are they meeting every week or every other week or what? Every other week for December 20th. Merry Christmas. It's another meeting of the Planning Commission. Yeah, sometimes they meet every week. It just kind of has been depending. Well, they depend. I think they meet like the second and fourth or the first and third or something like that, Tuesdays or something like that. But they've, they've been so this time, what, Larry? Just said they've been augmenting that schedule. I think you know they're trying hard to 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 get a finished product, and it's extremely difficult uh, to to do that. And so it's taking a long time. Well, last time, as I recall, somebody sent out. Was it Jan sent out, or it was Jan or Ann Winchester sent out the latest version. Yes, they now have gotten into that pattern. For the last two meetings, they send us the latest version. So and I think Anne is then, you know, based on either votes or discussion, she's revising the language and then bringing it back. And I, I think we're now in the loop for getting copies. Good. That's great. Are you getting those, Stephanie? Did you get, this is yeah. Anne's draft number four. Did you get that? I believe I did. Okay. Uh, yeah. I, it came from Anne. The last one came from Ann. The previous one, I think, came from uh, Jan. I got the one from Ann just re recently. Yeah, in fact, I had some communication with her about some of it. Yeah, I mean, I just find it easier to personally to deal with Ann than the whole planning commission. And then, you know, she agrees. She, she takes it to them. Yeah, I think she's very helpful to, you know, just keeping this document straight and incorporating and then, of course, she, with her experience on the DRB and the Planning Commission, you know, she's asking very practical questions of how does this, you know, is this language adequate or is this language confusing or whatever? Yeah, as I said, I think it's terrific that she got involved and that they've accepted her, her help. You know, I mean, there's only four of them. Right. You know, look at what we try to do. and We don't do anything close to what they do with just, you know, six of us. Four of them doing this major overhaul of the because it's not just the shoreland zoning, they're doing other stuff too, and other aspects of the zoning regulations. So, yeah, it's a big job, there's no question. Yeah. Well, thank you and Larry for staying on this. Yeah, it's just great. That well, you yeah, I think, it's, work. I think it's just really good, and I'm, I'm just pleased that they're uh, yeah, willing, willing to work with you. Yeah, they were almost part of the group now. <laughs> I mean, oh. when they let when we left last night they said are you coming back on the 20th i thought whoa we've come a long way <laughs> you know from the beginning my comments i was surprised that they they're dealing with you know specific you know water quality stuff and you know it's stuff that the conservation commission and especially the lakes and streams committee has some expertise on and so I was surprised. In fact, I was flabbergasted that they didn't do more to include you over the last few years when they were working on this stuff. And I think they could have saved themselves a lot of time and difficulty if they had just done this from the beginning. But at least they finally come around and I think it's terrific and it'll be a much, much better product. And we'll have much better protection. Exactly. Thanks. Well, thanks to yeah. you guys and your, your diligence. Yeah, your input. I and mean, we just sit around and listen to what everybody else is doing and say, oh, that's great. <laughs> well, that's true. Doing it. <laughs> um, okay, so you'll it, you'll go back and continue and send us anything you want and 
you know, I guess, you know, we won't be meeting until the beginning of January, but they pro they might still be working on it, right? I mean, they're not going to finalize something on December 20th, it doesn't sound like. Well, it doesn't, if we're going the kind of speed we've been, it won't happen next time. Yeah. So we might have another chance to talk about it with you before something gets finalized. And then it goes to the select board. But my understanding is there's likely going to be a big change on the select board. Oh. So. What? 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 I don't know what I don't know what I'm free to disclose. Okay. Well, you know, Rick's term is up and Sharon's term is up. I have no idea if they're going to run again. Huh. Mark Daly was just elected to the legislature. He's not going to stay around. Well, there was some talk about him staying at least a year and perhaps for his term. I think some of his colleagues suggested that he should stay. <laughs> It's a lot of work. Maybe some lot he of should, work. but I don't know that he's going to. Yeah. So anyway, um, but this isn't going to get, you know, they they have like what four months or something to um I'm not sure how it's 120 days, and I'm not sure 120 days to what? Do they have to do it within 120 days? Do I think they so. take at least 120? I, I just don't remember. Oh yeah, you're right. Is. I don't know either. Do what? What's it? The select board has to hold a hearing. Yeah, there has to be a, they have to have a hearing. And then at some point, once the select board has signed off on whatever the document, whatever shape it's in, uh, at that point, it goes to the town for the townspeople to vote on. And that could happen at a town meeting, but it doesn't have to. It could be a specially called vote. And, and it won't be done in time for this town meeting, I understand. It's not definitely not happening for this town meeting. Not going to. Yeah. Okay. Thank okay, you. Well, thanks for listening. I'm gonna I'm gonna say goodbye to you all. Thank you. Bye. Thanks Bye. a lot. See you next time, I hope. Yep. All right, thank <laughs> you. See you. Thank you so much. Bye. Okay. Okay. So the next thing on the agenda is the curb cut ordinance. And everybody had an assignment. Yep. And did anybody do them? Yeah, I did. I didn't find anything really, except my assignment was to look up, um, you know, the co connection between, um, you know, the curb cut and natural history, you know, any kind of, its effect on living things, ecology. I didn't find anything except I did find, um, the only thing I came up with with it was was the Vermont Rain Garden Manual, rain gardens, and so I thought that could be interesting, either to put in when there's a con controversial rain garden. I mean, there's a controversial curb cut that you either require people to put in um, rain gardens, or the town puts in a rain garden, or how would I, I have no idea. I don't understand because I've never put one in before. But what is the same manual? I mean, what is it that they would, under well, what circumstances would they want, would be required and what would they be required? I no idea. I would think in situations where um, it's running out, like there's, I mean, I don't know because it seems like most of the, that as far as I know, most of the um, curb cuts are usually on, uh, a driveway to a main road or to another road. And so I don't know what situations exist that would, in which a rain guard might be appropriate. Julie, I thought about this after you and I had quickly emailed back and forth. Um, something that we should look at potentially for curb cuts it's just not something that i have tons of familiarity with other than like my general understanding about how curb cuts affect everything um we should look at the stormwater standards for the state um the other thing that i was thinking that we could potentially look at <clears throat> um would be the dot manual um and see if there's anything in the department of transportation standards um for how curb cuts are done um and things like that those are the only thing that I could just sort of off the top of my head was thinking about um, as other sources of information we could potentially get some information from. 
I just curb cuts really aren't where I live with my job. So I didn't, you know, I haven't really thought about them. So no, I don't know. It's my, it's all new to me too. Well, I think so. I'm thinking about say there's a vernal pool and somebody wants to put a driveway in next to the vernal pool. Well, it would still be the same standards that the state applies, right? You'd have to identify vernal pool. Then you'd look at the um, boundaries, the buffers and things like that. Um, directionality of buffers, what species you're seeing in the pool. It's all the same type of, it's all the same thing you would see in fragmentation or in forestry. If they're doing like a large clear cut or something like that, same, same general idea, um, just on a smaller scale, hopefully. You said, you said you would look at the state standards. So what state standards are you talking about? And, you know, what is the state? Uh, I think for Vermont, for a vernal, like for a vernal pool, I think the state regulation is 50 feet buffer. You're not allowed to cut anything. Um, but there's Pretty another. Sure. I don't think the state has any standards about vernal pools. I, I think the kind of things that have fall between the cracks related to wildlife. Yeah, I think you can get it again. Wildlife road crossings, those kinds of things. Neil, I'm having a hard time understanding you. I don't yeah, know. Yeah, I was gonna say I couldn't hear you, Neil. I heard something about road crossings, and that's all I got. I don't. I don't. Can you hear me? Yeah. I don't think that the state has any stand any um, regulations about vernal pools. They're just kind of best practices or recommendations. And similarly for wildlife road crossings and amphibian road crossings, um, those things. There, there are no rules about them, but it's kind of an oversight. Like those are things we would like to be able to consider, I would think. So we would want to come up with some standards. Where would we find some suggestions? No, Neil, kind of there are standards in, for vernal pools. They're considered class two wetlands because they're considered significant. Okay, but they're not mostly not mapped. Right, 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 right. That's the problem, right? So most of them are on private property or unmapped. So you would have to, you know, require the a wetland delineation and a wetland scientist go out on site and identify it. There'd be a whole host of things that would have to happen in order to require that. The section that I was working on was like the surface water section and I included wetlands in there. I wonder if it makes sense to just have a sentence in my section that in, that says like this. I would, I would put vernal pools under wetlands. Um, they are a wetland resource. They're regulated as a wetland resource. Um, and obviously, you know, there's a whole wildlife factor associated with and how those species move in the landscape. Um, but I, I would toss that under wetlands. Yeah. The other, the, the big one, another big one related to wildlife, I feel like is these wildlife road crossings, which we have mapped. Mm -hmm. Um, and there aren't any, you know, there's not much to look about, about them. You can look at like kind of how they were mapped in the first place and whatever, but we should just have a standard that says you can't put a curb cut in a wildlife road crossing unless you really need to or whatever. Well, what would be the uh, distance? I mean, would there, you know, how far away from a road, uh, how a wildlife crossing? Well, um, they mapped out these like areas that are, it's not a point, it's a, an area of the road. They're so, corridors. Yeah, there are these corridors. So it's like, this 30 foot section is a wildlife road crossing. I think the kind of easy way to do it is to just say like, you can't put a camera in one of those areas. Yeah, that's about the most straightforward of all these things, I think. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. It's definitely the road. There's no question that it's part of the road. I get my, my point with, unless you want to was like, there probably is some language to allow people to in some circumstances there are there are properties where you just wouldn't be able to have a driveway anywhere i was gonna say like what if so here would be my question like what if somebody buys a piece of property 
and then they like don't know that wildlife corridors are a thing and then of course that's like the only frontage that they have like what if you're avoiding a wetland and the only place if you're avoiding this wetland to put in your um driveway is through the middle of the wildlife corridor right like do we want them to go through the wetland <laughs> to avoid the wildlife corridor or well, you know, that's just one of those things that comes up. I mean, there obviously there has to be some flexibility or I'm assuming there does. You know, I'm thinking about the um, the hearing they're having right in the town hall right now about the proposed subdivision on the Bank Kamoli Road. Um, and the driveway goes very close to a wetland. In fact, goes into part of the wetland. And, you know, they're all trying to figure out what to do about that. Um, and I think it's a wildlife crossing there too. You know, so, you know, I mean, I mean, obviously it depends on how the language is written, but it, it, there, there needs to be more consciousness of this. There really does. And I think, you know, in terms of curb cuts, this is a good place to make it be because of the potential damage that driveways right. can, can do. And, you know, so, you know, it's definitely worth... I think it's definitely worth coming, trying to come up with some language that accomplishes this. Right. But how might somebody know that they have their their driveway is in a wildlife crossing area? Well, they they put in an application for a curb cut. And oh. There's this form that the town has to fill out and they have to check off. And somebody's got to look at the map and say, oh, that's not a wildlife crossing or or it is right. it's, it's then we give them that feed mark. yeah somebody's got to check it off and if they say it is maybe it's if it's that's the time at which you know and 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 i guess the form should include uh the information on where to go to find out and then if they do find out that say it's the wildlife crossing there what they need to do is maybe at that point hire somebody to evaluate it same thing with the wetland. If it's a wetland, they need to find somebody. I, I don't know whether it's this. Well, with wetlands, it would be the state because it would have because state has regulations about wetlands. I don't know the state has regulations about wildlife crossings, do they? I don't think so. But 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 all this information would be in the application for a curb cut that would then guide them to what they should be doing. After that, I mean, in the language would have to have something about, you know, attempts to avoid at all possible or whatever, yeah. you know, and that's just something. Um, Stephanie, could I, there's something that troubles me about this whole enterprise because I don't understand it and maybe you do or, or Neil might. I mean, a curb cut in some ways is just a section right at the edge of the public highway. And the traditional concern is if you're at that point, is that a safe place? Can you yeah. get out? How does, you know, how does it affect the traffic yeah, on that public road? Way. Blah, blah, blah. We're talking about something else. We're talking about the roads that, that are gonna be used from this curb cut and how they tie into development and what's gonna happen on that property and, and so forth. Uh, is there, is, and I have a trouble thinking about using the curb cut concept, if that's what we're really looking at is the overall question of how is any of this development, but specifically the road as well, mainly only the road, affecting what's back there on that property? Yeah, no, I, I think you're going further than we're talking about. I mean, the curb cut itself goes into a road, right? I mean, that's what happens. It's a, it's a driveway of some sort, it goes into a road. And there's a section there where it's actually in the right of way, right? There's a right of way there. And right. it could be, it could even be, I understand what your concern is because, you know, and that was one of the questions I think we had that came up last time is to what extent is the driveway involved itself in the, in the curb cut? You know, to what extent can, can what happens on the driveway or what the driveway is doing be considered as part of the curb cut application. And I, I think I was gonna look into it and I didn't, I don't even know where to look into it. But um, like for instance, 
the existing uh, state law is that there has to be a flat area before you enter the road. The road. So if the driveway is on a slope, it can't just slide, you know, whoop, right into the road. They have regulations about how much it has to, how much flat area there has to be. And I, I guess in my mind, conceptually, that's sort of the area I'm thinking about. You know, those are the area where they took the trees down along the road in order to improve the sight lines, you know, because so, the sight lines are the focus of the curb cut or ordinance and law. That That's right now, that's mostly the focus is sight lines. Can, you know, can people see when they come out, if people come around the curb, they're going to be able to see. But in the, in the, in the dealing with that, it seems to me that it implicates other things. And in the case of the one on Nelson Pond, it clearly implicated trees because they were taking trees down to improve the sight lines at which the road commissioner said, oh, great, just take these trees down and you'll comply. And I'm saying, wait, there's other, there's other things that might be implicated. And one of them is trees. And another one might be that that happens to be a, a wildlife crossing or Right there, we're talking about right there. Or maybe there's a wetland right there. So what about slopes? If that's if that's true, that it's kind of limited just to the right of way and you need a flat area, then and how does it affect can we, slope? Can we say anything about slope? Like that because a hilarious flat. I did a lot of research on slope. <laughs> yeah. I've got two pages of it on like four towns around us. But uh -huh. but it's not but it but if the curb cut is just about that little part that attaches to the road, then this doesn't apply, right? Like I, we've got rules about slope and building on slope and callus that all say 15% or goes to um, conditional review by the DRB. Woodbury doesn't have the word slope anywhere in their zoning ordinance at all. In their zoning? Woodbury does not have the word slope anywhere. And the Woodbury <laughs> zoning ordinance is 30 pages and it's a image, not a PDF. So you can't search. You just have to scan through and read every word. The only percentages in that entire ordinance are about um, the amount of trees you can remove. But the word slope is not there anywhere. East Montpelier is very similar to us. Their language is really similar about whether or not you can build and where you can build, except everything where Callis says 15%, East Montpelier says 25%. Yikes. Wow. wow. Plainfield is pretty much the same as us. It's 15%. They actually have curb cuts in their zoning plan. They do. And it says as a condition of access approval, and they call curb cuts access management, and then they have parentheses right next to that curb cuts. Yeah. The condition of access approval, compliance with all ordinances and regulations pertaining to roads and land development is required. And this is immediately after the one that names 15% as a steep slope. So like they've all got slope in them, except for Woodbury. And it's all 15% except East Montpelier. But if the curb cut by state law is the, like the last four feet that's flat, then none of this applies because there is no slope. Then it's a zoning thing. Yeah. Well, then, it's, yeah, that's interesting. It's in the zoning. It didn't occur to me to look in zoning. I was looking in, I was looking for curb cut ordinances from other towns. Um, and they're mostly, they mostly just sort of track what the state law says, but remember what the state law says. Remember the state law talks about having to be in compliance with the existing land use. Um, here, let me go find it. Remember we talked about that last time. So it's not, it's kind of interesting because they talk about it having to be in compliance and with the planning goals. Of 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 twenty four Title twenty four section I think it's forty three oh two, which which kind of kind of implies that it goes beyond just that little chunk of something at the end of the you know that's going on to the road. I mean, what kind of planning goals, you know, are they talking about? Um, you know, and and I. I thought I printed it out, but I don't see it here with my stuff. I thought I printed out those planning goals because, you know, they're really broad and they don't, they don't, at first, they really don't seem to have a lot to do with, you know, 
traditional curb cuts. And yet the state statute says they have to be in compliance with, it says, um, da, 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 and then a necessary, okay, wait a minute. Protection of the public investment in existing highway infrastructure as a test for reasonableness. Okay, wait, let me go back. It's one of these long, long sentences. The agency or legislative, okay, wait. God, I don't want to bore everybody with this, but it, it long, long sec, sec, sentence. As a condition of any such permit, compliance with all local ordinances and regulations relating to highways and land use shall be required. It sounds like that's what Plainfield put in its zoning. Yeah. And it's, the agency or legislative body may make such rules to carry blah, 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 as will adequately protect and promote the safety of the traveling public. Here we go. Maintain reasonable levels of service on the existing highway system. Protect the public investment in the existing highway infrastructure, but in, shall in no case deny reasonable entrance and exit to or from property abutting the highways, except on limited access highways, comma, using safety maintenance of reasonable levels of service on the existing highways and necessary to be consistent with the planning goals of 24 VSA 4302 and to be compatible with any regional plan, state agency or approved municipal plan. That is one sentence. Yeah, yeah, it's a long sentence. So that is what gave our town attorney, Joe Mc McLean, when he told me that he argued this in for 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 a town, I think it was a town of Underhill, that they could do that because that they could have environmental criteria because of all of this language. And that's what it to me, it implies something more than the little 20 rod white right of way. Is that what it is? 20 rods or whatever it is, the little tiny bit of public land at the end of the driveway. So I, I, that's what gave me the idea that we could include more, but I don't know. You know, Stephanie, I mentioned something about the town of Essex at a meeting previously when I um, mistakenly recalled that what of the town um, official sent me was talking about curb cuts. It was really talking about um, zoning in connection with scenic yeah. interference yeah. and all that. But I, but I looked at their regulations um, and something that's very similar to, or in part at least, to what Neil was just talking about um, is in theirs and it ties together the kind of zoning DRB approval of what's gonna happen there to the acquisition of the access, i.e. the curb cut, and it's maybe very and close to the same language. It says, oh, really? Subdivision or site plan approval is also required. Highway access approval, curb cuts, uh, shall be obtained following the issuance of such approvals. Uh, town or state highway access approval must be obtained prior to the issuance of a certificate of occupancy. So this is basically saying, you gotta tell us what you're gonna do with this, and if it's part of some development thing, you got to get the development thing approved before you can get your curb cut approved. That's that what I really interesting. Can you send that around? Uh, yeah. Or uh, something it's, it's a long document. Um, I can I can send the one page that I'll, I'll find some way to send it. Or a link to the zoning itself on the. Okay, maybe maybe that's what I'll do, and just tell you what page this particular thing is on. That's so interesting. Yeah. That is. <clears throat> but what I don't understand is that we're talk you're talking about the regulations. You need a flat area before you come out on it. Well, yeah, you know, they even they do have it a little bit on that disaster on Nelson Pond Road. You know, but there's lots of places where driveways where people come out and it's not flat. That's yeah, I don't think well, anyway. I See, somewhere here I can find it what the language is about it. I mean, I just I'm thinking of I mean there's lots of hilly entrance driveways, driveways that enter. Oh, they come just jutting down right into the road. I, Your road. <laughs> I <laughs> I mean, I'm thinking of Walter Forrest's driveway goes right into the road on a hill. 
There's a hill. I'm thinking yeah, of the Pecan that comes down before you get from New Route 14, before you get to uh, the intersection of uh, Peck Hill. There's a driveway, a very, very steep driveway there. I thought that there was language about it. Um, I thought so too, I remember that. Well, here, oh no, this is the entrance. I didn't check this, it says, Access grades, the entrance area from the proposed access to the town of highway shall be constructed in accordance with Vermont Agency of Transportation Standard Sheet B71. This requirement is to allow vehicles a safe place to enter and exit the road during slippery conditions. I suspect that that's the, there's a reference, that's a reference to that, although, it, you know, then where standard sheet B11 or B71, is that attached to their ordinance? No, this is Callis's ordinance. Um, I can look at the state statute again. Um, it be interesting, you guys, I think I sent you all the state statute. It'd be interesting to, for you to look at it again because I keep finding things in it. Um, and a lot of it isn't relevant, but a lot of it is, it has to do with utilities and stuff. Um, it's that B, driveway entrances that, that I was reading from before. Um, well, should take a look at it and see if there's, you see anything in there that's interesting. Um, it's all about sewer lines and so installing sewer lines. And then there's a lot of language about what to do if somebody violates it. But anyway, I can't find it off the top of my head. I thought there was something in there and there may be about it. Um, but in any event, there is, a, there is a piece that is in the highway right of way, which I suppose can be regulated. Hmm. I don't know. I don't know what else to say. Um, I mean, I don't know. I don't know how far we can go in learning how much regulation, you know, the, or, or I'm sorry, the how much area, actual area, can be subsumed or included in you know, a curb cut. Do you need a zoning permit to build a driveway? No. No, however, well, maybe John was looking, I remember that one on, on Nelson Pond Road, I said at the site visit, holy gamoli, look at the slope. And John McCullough, the zoning administrator said, it complies, it's under 15%. So I don't know now that I'm thinking about it, what he was referring to, because you don't need a, I, I don't think you need a zoning permit. I think you only need a curb cut permit, but is there a slope? I don't think there's a slope in the Callis ordinance. Regulating, you mean a slope? A maximum slope. slope. Not in, at least not in the curb cut approval. It doesn't mention anything about slope. So uh, I could ask John where he got that. I mean, where does the, uh, I can ask John. Uh, what else applies to a curb cut in addition to the ordinance? And where does slope regulated? So I remember he said that. Kind of where is it measured, right? Is it well, just maybe the it was, you know, I wonder if it was an accessory use. I wonder if he did need a zoning permit because this was a um, garage. This was a driveway to a garage that was the, an accessory to the house. And maybe that's what they needed. They needed some kind, they needed a zoning permit because it was an accessory use to a house. I, I just don't know. I, I'll have to ask John. Looking at the district standards and they, they do mention driveways. Uh, driveways are permitted in setbacks that shall be at least five feet from a side or rear property line. Driveway slopes greater than 15% are subject to conditional reuse review. What, 
What are you reading, Neil? That's our zoning, our zoning regs, um, and that's like in the village district. But that sentence is repeated. Uh, in every they say, districts. yeah, in every district, they say the same thing. So they do. Oh, okay. Driveway slopes. Yeah. No, it does seem like it does seem like this. Some of this stuff should like should be in the zoning. Yeah, I mean that's. Yeah, it should be. Harder for us to move the needle on, but. But if it's not, we could still do it, as long as it, we come within those parameters of those standards that they talk about in that section of the state law that I read. Mm -hmm. You know, and as I said, when I talk, I I'm going to talk to him again. I want to call the town attorney again, talk to him about it a little more, um, because we were talking about it. You know, I was talking about environmental criteria. I wasn't talking about specifically how much, how much of the land is in, is included in the curb cut. Yeah, right. isn't that the question we have? Yeah, I think so. So I suppose before we, ex except for the um, the wildlife crossing and and any wetlands, I guess that are right there, right? I mean, I think that's much more straightforward and tree cutting, because we're talking about, yeah. that's, in, you know, people cut trees in order to. I should probably also mention like they, I, if they're shade trees, they technically need to follow the shade tree ordinance too. So that, that should probably be mentioned that they have Complicate to. things. But if, if a shade tree is in, is blocking the sight line, which takes precedence. Well, they still have to talk to the um, to the tree warden. Yeah, you know, they'd have to warn it. And if someone had a problem with it, they'd have to bring it to the select board, and then the select board would decide. Or then... Yeah. Okay. Yeah, really, it's the question is of is slopes, huh? Like wetlands, wildlife road crossings, um, tree cutting are all things that, even if it was only talking about the right of way itself, would still apply. And also, you know, the other question would be if um in addition to slopes if if curb cut permits could actually it's like how far can they go you know i mean what if there's a wetland that's not right in the town right of way but it's just past it i mean but you know and but then you'd think that would that would have to come up in the zoning yeah it would also you'd have to talk about wetlands and buffers right because certain buffers or excuse me certain wetlands have buffers um, depending on the class, and that has to be confirmed by the state of Vermont. Somebody from the state agency needs to come out and confirm your wetland class too. So, but if it's not, if it's on somebody's land adjacent to their driveway, doesn't it doesn't matter if it's a wetland with a buffer? That buffer would still extend. I think it's not necessarily a curb cut issue. That's all. I understand they still need to get their own, they have to, you know, they have to deal with the yeah, wetland. they have to get a wetland permit from the state. But that's not necessarily something that can be included in a curb cut ordinance. That's all I'm saying. It might not. Understood, yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. So you're saying that it would be regulated that way. It would be regulated otherwise. It would be regulated under a state of Vermont wetland permit. Yeah. But like the same thing with the, you know, vernal pools would be regulated under a state um, streams, things like that, right. or at least they should be, unless somebody does it without getting a permit. <laughs> and maybe our zoning mentions wetlands; they're regulated by the state, but we still our zoning still says there's this 50 foot buffer yep. for wetlands, and that's kind of independent from the state regulations. Um, but it's not a bad thing. And it feels especially not a bad thing for vernal pools to me. Like that's, yes, it's regulated by the state, but nobody's enforcing it. But if we put it in the curb cut ordinance, then someone's got to go check the box that they looked in. Right, exactly. And like 
I feel like wetlands are more far more understood than at least by the general public from what a vernal pool is. Um, a lot of people just look at it like, well, that only fills up with water, you know, two months, three months of the year. That's not a wetland. It's dry most of the year. And I can fill that in. It's not a, it's just a hole. Um, so a lot of people just don't understand that significance. And like you said, most vernal pools are not mapped. Most people don't know what they are. They don't know they're there. They don't. So I, that to me is a more delicate issue that if we could rope that in, I would feel. That would be good. <laughs> um, Stephanie, just going back for a minute to that thing I was talking about. Um, clearly, it would be great if our curb cut standards worked in tandem with our underlying zoning standards. And this Essex and then what was it, Plainfield? Plainfield. Um, saying that here's how it works. You do the zoning stuff first. Yeah. And if you get the zoning stuff approved, then you ask us for a curb cut. Yeah. But that would mean to me that everything, including the driveway and whether the driveway is approved and anything else you're going to do, has already been approved and you've gotten DRB permission to do it. And you say, OK, I got all this. Can I please have the curb cut? You can see far enough down the road this way and that way. Yeah. Because well, that Larry, do you think that uh, that's something we could put in the curb cut ordinance? That they have to get their zoning permit first? Uh, yes. I, well, I think we could try it. Yeah. Yeah, I do too. But it's not always the case. Like um, curb cuts are also for like farm entrances where mm -hmm. you drive the tractor in to mow the field or whatever. And there's not. I sort of feel like it should happen in tandem. I don't necessarily think they should be separate. Are you going to approve it and then tell them they can't cut the driveway at the last minute? That seems like poor planning. Good point. Yeah. So, I mean, it would make, it's like Neil's talking about a curb cut that doesn't relate to zoning, I would assume, because it's just for giving tractor into the field. Right. But we're not in charge of this, I'm assuming, but it would make sense that if the zoning, like the zoning application requires you to do all the steps, including getting the curb cut approved, which connects back to the like it's the tandem thing you're saying right it's one thing you can't get the zoning you can't get everything else approved without also getting the curb cut approved and they're one form one process or one stack of forms you all submit at once you know that's interesting i wonder if um if it could be added without changing the zoning if it could be added to the uh zoning application form that you that's what i'm yeah yeah but, that's something they have to check you would still also be able to do a curb get a curb cut without a zoning application right you don't need, yeah if you don't need a zoning permit right. yeah. so you'd still want the curb cut to stand alone and yeah. give provide the protections that we want to yeah this is always so, more complicated than i had thought it would be it would be two issues it would be the curb cut itself and also possibly going through zoning? It seems like there's got to be a way to say that, right? To say that this curb cut application with its requirements will be done at the same time as the zoning if that is part of the larger project. And if it's just the curb cut for the tractor into the field, then it's just this document. And it still has these concerns about wildlife crossings and other things. But yeah, you don't have to do the rest. But if you have to do the rest, it's all one packet that you do together. Yeah, just sort of what I think they were getting at in, in plain fields. And I think that's so. what they seem to say. Mark, you found that, was that on Plainfield's website? Yeah, it was. Um, it's there yeah. in their zoning regulations. It's just my yeah. laptop's nearly dead, but I'll see if I can find it before it dies. Yeah. The kind of crux of it would be, would be related to the zoning, right? You wouldn't get your permit until yep. you had approved curb cut, basically. Yeah, and of course, the way I look at it, you couldn't get your curb cut until you had approved zoning. Right, one <laughs> yeah. thing, you're just yeah. doing it. Yeah. But it is, I, yeah, it is different people. Like the curb cut application is like. Goes to the select board. Goes to the select board. They ask the road commissioner, whatever the, 
director of public works to go out and like fill out the form and then it comes back to them. Yeah. But we could change that, you know, because one of the things I would change is having them being required to somehow consult with the Conservation Commission. You know, which reminds me that when I started working on this the other day, I took out the town's ordinance and read it really closely and went, this thing is so confusing yeah. and redundant and repetitious. And so I was thinking, you know, of kind of a bigger picture of just this thing needs to be rewritten. You know, I think it's it Waitsfield I looked at, they have a very clear process for getting a curb cut per. It's very clear. Not not we're not so clear. And and in doing that, we could put in the process some of the things we're talking about. I am I am wary of uh, needing to consult with the conservation commission. Um because it feels like that makes it a bigger process. Like having been involved. Yeah, but who would they talk to? I mean, you know, if 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 the zoning, if the uh curb cut application says that they they can't be in a wildlife corridor, how you know, who are they going to talk to about that? The zoning administrator certainly doesn't know anything about wildlife corridors. Well, it's it's there on the map. It's like it would have to be the person filling out that curb cut form would have to be able to go it has to be easy for them they have to be able to like okay here's what i do here's the url i go to the website i see if it's that thing i check the box um i'm just thinking the way it is now it's like it's not too big a pain for that farmer who wants to get in and cut the field or whatever right. they, uh, goes to the town office does this and then he goes to the next select board meeting and they tell him yep you're good to go does he really need to get a curb cut permit now? Yeah. Wow. I mean, I think a lot of, you know, a lot of field entrances are already, whatever, grandfathered in. So it yeah. probably doesn't happen all the time, but. Yeah. So. You know, it's nine o'clock. I think this has been a great discussion. It's like a really interesting, more, much more complicated than I had. Also. So, yeah. um, I guess, you know, I mean, we could start working on, I'm not sure how to proceed. How should we proceed? I need to find out if anybody like our lawyer has any thoughts about how far it could go, the, you know, how far into a property um, it could go. But what Larry's saying about or Mark is saying about the Plainfield one, it seems like. Yeah, they kind of buried. That's why I'm trying to find it again. It took a while clicking around to get to it. Yeah. Stephanie, would it make sense for us to think about talking with our colleagues on the DRB and possibly the Planning Commission about this sort of conundrum that we have about, you know, how do these curb cuts, you know, how far can it go, regulation go under the curb cut provisions? I'm, a, I'm afraid they wouldn't know anything more than we do. Pardon? I don't think they would know anything more than we do. No, but there's just more people who are concerned about the process, thinking about how it could work. You get their attention and their time, and I'll do it. Um, you know, I mean, I just think we should go ahead and do what we want to do, and then take it out for public comment and see what happens. Meaning you know, we should kind of ignore this idea that it should be combined with the zoning permits and stuff and just focus on the curb cut? Well, we could say that, we could suggest or recommend that it, I mean, they're not going to change the zoning right now. So the question is, could we do that in the curb cut permit application? Could, 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 could the permit curb cut application, <laughs> I'm tired. Um, I can't even make a sense. Could it, it could it re, could it require uh, a concurrent zoning up, you know, process to try to have the processes happen at the same time in some way, even though it's in front of different people? We have to think that through about 
And yeah, I mean, other people might have some ideas, Larry. I'm not trying to reject that suggestion. You know, because we really all, there really are only six of us. And while we're six very brilliant, <laughs> uh, we're only six. And more people sometimes are helpful. So what do you want to do? I think because my sense is that because zoning regulations aren't going to change anytime we're not in the process of changing zoning regulations i think we should really work on this curb cut and make some curb cut regulations that are clear and then maybe at a later time we can combine the two somehow or make them i don't know that's my thought yeah i mean the select board is just their you know their minds are on a lot of other things they 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 started, you know, we've got to do something about this ordinance. It's from 2004 and it's really out of date. And Stephanie says the Conservation Commission thinks there should be some environmental criteria involved. And yes, you know, let's hear from them sometime. You know, now they're doing budget. You know, they're meeting like twice a week or something to do budget. So it's not anything urgent. I think we have time to play around with this and come up with various things. So I would just suggest that everybody you know, just think about, I'll, I'll find out what I can find out legally, if there's anything to find out legally, and then just think some more about, you know, how how you would want to do it, what kind of language would you want in, in each of these areas? Um, or, or you know, if, if you have the time or inclination, just keep poking around and seeing what else you could find. That I mean, that that's really helpful to Essex and the Plainfield, you know, that people have come up with. So I, I would just, you know, I'll put it on the agenda for, for January and, you know. Keep poking around. What? I said, let's put it on the agenda for next time. We'll keep poking around for now. Let's go home and go to sleep before brains collapse. Or the roads. Yes. Yeah, yeah, you know, good, good luck everybody driving. And what's the date of January? Um, Something like the fourth, I think, but I'm not sure about that. Yeah, it's the fourth. Yeah. Well, so let's plan on, let's plan on, I just lost you all. Where are you, Zoom? Let's plan on doing it January 4th. Is that? Sure. Is that good? And, and then we'll see too where the Shoreland zoning is by then. And we'll have to go back to school sometime around then. We'll go back on a Tuesday, so that sounds great. Okay, thank you. Sir. Can yeah, I? Move? How much time do you get off? Um, we get all our last day is the twenty second, and then we go back on I think the second, third, something like that. So it's like at least two weeks. Yeah, it's just about two weeks. Yeah, that's cool. amazing. That's a good, less long one break. Can I, can I move that we adjourn so that our good friend from Orca can go yes. home and go to bed, and then we can talk as long second. as we want? So okay. I completely yeah. forgot Orca's here, but thank you all from com for coming or appearing or whatever you've done. <laughs> we appeared magically. Okay.